بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is Imam Zaid Shakir and I'm honored to be here first of all on behalf of Zaytuna College and we welcome all of you who might view this uh, recording but I'm honored to be here with Aisha Gray Henry and she's graced us with her presence today to share in a little conversation about sainthood, wilaya, and uh, how we view this as Muslims, how our beliefs might uh, intersect or overlap with the beliefs of other faiths. So you are familiar with her work at Fons Vitae. Uh, she's a living legend in that regard. And now with her great, great work with the Ghazali Children's Project along with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and many, many others. So without further ado, we will start the conversation. Bismillah. alaikum Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So yeah, what, what are your views on this issue? I'm sure over the course of working in the uh, context of Fons Vita and translating a lot of works that really deal with this subject directly or indirectly, what, what are some of your thoughts in the modern world, what we've lost, uh, what is, we could say, good riddance to if we can? I don't think we can, but your thoughts on the matter. Well, here we are in a, a state that has Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, all the same towns named Santa after Santa. Santa Rita. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One wonders why were these towns named after these saints? What was it that people recognized before or were devoted to or honored that we're not honoring today? And you know what I think has happened is that people have altogether somehow lost that the true nature of man is the fitra, which is the sanctified state. You know, and it's called different words in different traditions. Adama, it's called the Christ nature, the Buddha nature. And this nature is our true nature, and it's who we already are, a sanctified state, present before God and humble. And sadly, I think in the modern world, people are misidentifying. They are identifying with the uh, lower nafs, the nafs salamara. Right. They are identifying with their egoic, separative lives, Absolutely. with their problems, their sufferings, instead of making the true identification with the true nature right. who they are. they don't, people don't have to become saints they just have to stop identifying with what is not the true essence of of man the right. imago dei right I, and i think something you mentioned in terms of identifying with that mm -hmm. lower nature mm -hmm. that's something that unites us mm -hmm. you know all of us we started the nafsul bahimiya shahwaniya mm -hmm. the bestio carnal mm -hmm. soul, and we're united by that. And I think the ethos of our modern period where there's this emphasis on equality. Now, political equality is a wonderful, laudable concept, mm -hmm. but the whole idea of sainthood is that there are there is an elect. There are those who have elevated themselves beyond the, the confines or the entrapment of this lower soul. And in denying such an emphasis, emphatic denial of hierarchy, we deny, I think, the legitimacy of the fact that some human beings have elevated themselves spiritually to even move beyond the denial of spirituality for a lot of modern thinkers and mm -hmm. philosophers, but they've elevated themselves spiritually. And as a result, they have a closeness to God. They have a love for God and a love from God mm -hmm. that some people at a lower uh, level of spiritual development just don't possess. And I think that emphasis on this carnal nature that unites us and renders us all equal is sort of indicative of an overall race to the bottom in many aspects mm -hmm. of human endeavor. And what you say about the elevation, and then you spoke of closeness, you think about it, wasjud waka tariba, bow down and draw near. You are never nearer to God than when you're in prostration. And that is also the highest place to be. So part of the problem is 
is that people are are so attached to their outer personas right. and really reaching the the sacred state is emptiness and humility. Right. Absolutely, you and know. I, absolutely, and I was just thinking of that sort of attachment mm -hmm. to a persona. It arrogates us totally. It and it makes us, you know, I want to show who I am. I'm the man. I'm the woman. I'm in the house. And that sort of arrogance is reflective of Satan, of, of Satan. It's a satanic characteristic. Abba was stekbara. Satan refused mm -hmm. to humble himself before Adam, and he arrogated himself uh, above the divine command. And on the other hand, no one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates them. And so again, the idea of elevation, mm -hmm. the idea of this differentiation, those who haven't humbled themselves aren't elevated. And so this is a divine pronouncement mm -hmm. on, from the tongue of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings of Almighty God upon him. But it does emphasize that we have those who have elevated themselves and we have those who choose to debase themselves. Mm -hmm. He's ruined and disappointed who debases that soul and doesn't re refine it. There's quite an image. Um, it's like um, you have to go below below sea level in order for the ocean to pour in. If we're up, the ocean being God's presence, if we're up on the little hillocks of the nafs, you mm. see, there's no way. But it, it's only by emptying ourselves of all but Him that He can pour in. You know that. So really, if you look carefully at the prescriptions of any of the faith traditions, their very structures have in mind through pilgrimage, through fasting, through charity, through prayer. What is the end product that's being aimed at by these structures? Someone who is humble and serves. And that's the sanctified person. I mean, people look at Mother Teresa in India. She was humble and she served. It's very hard to do. But the truth is, is that one is being given in any faith tradition all the levels of methodology for doing so. But it depends how you do things. You could be generous to be seen by others. Right. Or you could be generous with uh, anonymity. Right. And that's the big thing. That's the hard one, is that you can have a choice with every moment in your life of doing the up thing, which is emptiness, or the down thing, which is me, in everything. And I think mm -hmm. when, and again, part of the modern condition, we mm -hmm. increasingly remove God from every equation, and especially the human equation. Mm -hmm. And so, as you say, you can be charitable uh, because you think there's some benefit to society in that, or you can be charitable because you see charity, uh, a charitable nature mm -hmm. within yourself as being reflective of this divine attribute. And as a human being, that there's something I've been given from God. The Christians would say it's grace through love or that the Muslims we would say that is the ruh, that that this spirit from God, mm -hmm. so not any part of his essence, but a very special mysterious creation that's been placed in the human being, that this gives us that ability to reflect those divine mm -hmm. attributes, and that in and of itself is something very beautiful, detached from any other consideration. You know, we're put in here to become saints, and it's not the saints that people think, you know, that image of saints that's wrongly had in the Western world today. If you mention you're interested in saints, I find that people look at you like, what are you talking about? That's not real, or that was in the Middle Ages. And all they have to realize is that when they meet a saintly person, you know, the emptier a person is, the more you love them. Because the more is gone from their egoic package. They're not bragging about what they've written, where they've traveled, who they know. That emptiness you love because you're loving God's yeah. presence in them. And also because mm -hmm. it draws you in. As you said, <laughs> yeah. that emptiness, that vacuum draws you in. 
And when someone's full of themselves, yeah. and we say it, yeah. he's full of himself. That repulses you. There's no room for you in there. And there's nothing in there to draw you in. So that person becomes very repulsive when he or she is full of themselves. And as you say, when that emptiness is there, there's an attractive, attractiveness. And no one was more attractive than our Prophet wasallam. So no one was, was more saintly than the Prophet. If you were coarse and crude and your heart was very dispassionate, they would have fled away from you. But you're the opposite of that, so you draw them in. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you see, we're really loving who we really, truly are. That's when we love that emptiness that's in someone. A few years ago, we were in Turkey and with a group. And the guides there, you know, who have been raised with the Ataturk idea that everything is secular, there's no, nothing sanctified, were giving the most sad descriptions of the monuments we were visiting and so forth. And then uh, Neville and I were at a, a luncheon with a group of people we hadn't met. We had published their book called Listen from the Kenai Refied uh, Order. And all the emails, I thought, this is a group of, I don't want to say old people because I'm all old, right? But I had this, then we met them and they were Young all... Young at heart. Uh, we, were, we met them and they were all like 40 years old with leather jackets, right? So... I said, you know, I'm really sorry for what these guides have just put our friends through. I mean, about what about saints today? And they said, well, Kareem here, his mother is the Oprah Winfrey of, of Istanbul. She is a, considered to be a saint. So I'm like this. He said, yes, she, she is, you know, has, she is in Kyoto and Peking and Berlin, and she has a chair at Chapel Hill. And I'm thinking, wow, like, you know, what is this exactly? And they said, well, we'll send you something she's written, some of her mystical discourses. And finally, in the end, we're publishing them now. I was reading them this summer, and it changed my life. I went to see her once, twice, and what struck me, this petite person as she talked, is there was only joy and happiness. There was nothing else there, nothing but joy. And visiting her in Istanbul, <clears throat> she mentioned that her father had been imprisoned and her mother, who was also a saintly woman, if not one, and her and another person in that lineage, her mother said, say alhamdulillah that your father is in prison because he is getting to share in the trial of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. And then she said, and I myself had lost a daughter. My mother said, alhamdulillah, you were participating in the trial of I forget whom. And I suddenly realized that we know that God tries the prophets the worst and then the saints and so on. Right. So that if you look at the trials and sufferings you are getting, you at the same time realize you're not getting the full one of them, but you're getting part of that package, you know, a shadow. So you can change your suffering and your trials into, ah, you know, I'm starting to go up or yeah. down as it were. Yeah. And then... She ended this book, well, I mean, the book, this is what really got me, was she's talking about, we all know in all the faith traditions, God is omniscient. He knows all. Everything is there. Our lives are decreed. In other words, my illnesses, my friends who have cancer, that's decreed. But we are 100% free in our destiny because at every moment of our body's time, 50, 60, 70, 80 years in present time, we can go up or down with that moment. If you're decreed to be, let's say, a generous person, you could do it to be seen of others or not. Mm -hmm. So at every moment in our being, we are working to create the state of being. We know we will leave in a state of being just by using that decree with emptiness and humility. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you, you, you've mentioned so many Themes. I mean, we could take one, any one, and mm -hmm. just fill the hour yeah. with it. But this whole idea of just purifying the moment that accompanies every breath, the harotul emphas, just every makes breath. you cry. This is all we've and, got. And mm -hmm. there are people who are so conscious of their every breath, and I think this is one quality of sainthood. Some people are oblivious, and so and so they waste their time or they fill their time with empty nothing. 
and even destructive things, but some people are so aware of the value and the precious nature of every single breath mm. that they make sure every moment that accompanies every breath, I'm going to fill that with the glorification and worship of God. I'm going to fill that with the service of my fellow human. I'm going to fill that with expressing the joy that we should have, knowing we're the recipients of God's grace and mercy. And some people, they hear this, and they say, oh, that's some kind of Sufi stuff, or, or they're just capitulating. That's some perennialism. That's Christian teaching. This is the Quran. Qul, bi fadlillahi wa bi rahmatihi fa bi barika falyafrahu huwa khayrun minma yajma'un. Say, in the grace of Allah and in his mercy, and this, let them rejoice, is better than anything they could gather from this world. And so I think we, we should be a joyous people, despite Islamophobia, despite the resurgent racism, despite these are all just the trials of the world. Let it they go. They come and they go. And, and per, if you put them in perspective, they're relatively minor. You know, it's the racism <laughs> of sort of a mm -hmm. resurgent white nationalism in, in America. Does it come close to the racism that was displayed during slavery in this country? or the height of Jim Crow, it, it pales into insignificance. The, the number of people who have bought into the inherent uh, racist ideas that inform slavery or Jim Crow, and the number of people who are buying into this resurgent white nationalism, what percentage of the populace? It's a small minority in reality. People have moved on by and large. And so I think if we really keep things in perspective, we can see how much we have to be joyous about and how much we have to be thankful to God for. And I think this is the value of the saint. The saint is the one, all right, the world, okay, it has its ups and downs, its goods and bads, but I'm with the law 24-7. Haven't you always wanted to be a saint? I think when did When did you first wish to be? I think not so much personally responding at a personal level, <laughs> like to be a saint, but to do the things that saints do, hoping that maybe God will say, you know what, I'll confer this honor on you. So if we could just do the things. I think when the prophet or, or Hadith Qudsi, where my servant doesn't draw close to me with anything more beloved than me, than the obligatory acts, so can, can I do those obligatory acts and be consistent in, in them? And my servant continues to grow, draw close to me with the voluntary acts until I love him, until I love her. And so if I could do those things and then Allah, mm -hmm. okay, I love you. Okay, mashallah. That's wilaya. Because the hadith starts, men adali waliyan. Whoever uh, transgresses against one who has this quality of wilaya. And as they summarize here, love, hata mm -hmm. Love, help, assistance, mahabba. Nusra wa qurba, and closeness. And so if I can do those things that draw me into the circle of divine love, and those things that draw me into the circle of divine help and aid and assistance and support, and do those things that draw me close to the divine, and then Allah chooses to bestow his love and mm -hmm. to draw me close and to, to assist me in my affair in the world, hey, that's good enough. Well, as a young girl, I read, you know, the lives of St. Francis of Assisi and <clears throat> other saintly beings and thought, that's it, you know, but then how do you get there? And then, of course, when we were driving across North Africa to go to Azhar, you know, the, the humble people that took us in, the people in the desert who gave us a bed, Man what we experienced, that generosity, that humility, that Alhamdulillah. kindness, you never recover from that. Absolutely. And of course, the, the years of the 70s in Cairo, in the company, in the presence of people like Sheikh Abdul Halim Mahmoud, Allah your home, Sheikh Saleh Ajafri, you know, these giants who we loved because they were nothing but what you were talking about, just that presence. And then you think, well, how do I get to that, you know? And I thought for years, if I just published all these books on the subject and read them, somehow I would get infused. But then I started noticing that when I'd shut a book, I was still me. 
you know, and mm -hmm. then when we started Sheikh Hamza and I, the Ghazali Children's Project, I realized when I read Ghazali, who is my guide, I thought I was reading him, but I was just clinging to the pages with my fingernails. It was more than I could hold on to, understand, or utilize, and I would shut the book, and nothing happened. I was still me. And then with the Children's Project, trying to bring each of these books into a language that a child can understand, I've been able to finally start to utilize and understand the interior meaning of prayer, of all of the gestures. But it's, it's, it's amazing what it takes, you know, for people to remember to do what you're talking yeah. about. You know, the prayer beads are a great help. I mean, Tasbia and all the traditions are meant to bring you back to the heart, the person you are, the, the, to identify with that and, and, fitra. and, to, and mm -hmm. to really understand that connection with Allah uh -huh. and how much we need Allah to Almighty God to really elevate us. Mm -hmm. We need Allah. We need Almighty God to humble us. We need God to bestow that understanding upon us. And all of those things, I think, really uh, bring to our conscious awareness the idea of an elect. So I was thinking when you said essentially to to I don't don't let me put words into your mouth. <laughs> it's all right. But you're reading and trying to cling to the pages, and then uh. by breaking this down to the level of a child, now you're beginning to understand. I what get the it. Imam is saying. You get it now, and I can use it. And you can use you it. You can use it. And and mm -hmm. that's a gift from God. And and God tells us. Allah Taala tells us. Uh, through his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings uh, mm -hmm. upon him, the one God wants good for, he gives him or her a sound understanding of the religion. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who are practicing the religion and they have some understanding and idea what it's all about, but there are some people who understand. And those people are elevated via their understanding. And so this the idea of just rejecting sainthood because sometimes how it's anti-egalitarian or it's uh, emphasizing these hierarchies or it's based on some false binary or all of these other things that are really tripping people up. I think we have to really show how these things are an integral part of our religion as many other faith traditions and that's what we have to connect to. As a Muslim, I have to connect with that. I have to understand it and recognize it because only through understanding and recognizing it will I possibly get a little piece of it. You know, it's funny when you said it's people considered anti-egalitarian. When you said that, I realized, no, it is the ultimate egalitarian because that is the true state, the one soul that we all share, yeah. the one soul that's nobody that's not male or female, that one, mm, that thing that we all are one of. And it's interesting when you, there's a way of addressing another person. It used to be, you know, that in Christianity, goodbye, you were really saying, God be with you. And Saint Seraphim of Seraph, when he addressed people, he said, your godliness. Just the way the Japanese bow to that divinity, recognizing it within, or the Persians put Jen, you know, at the end of a person's name, Sen, Sen, you know, whichever it is. But when we say Hadritic, Hadra is the presence of God. K is yours. So if I don't say sir to you, I say Hadritic. I'm acknowledging who you really are, you know, that essence that we all share. And really what we need to do is be present to that in each other and that would help us to remember who we are. If we were, if people spoke to that in us or was present to that in me, it would remind me not to be lost in this outer right. loss. You know, we, we need to remind each other of that through language and address. And also the rosary, the tasbia are very helpful to people you know, to help remind them. Yeah, yeah. Because the mind just keeps forgetting right. to be who it is. And you cannot grab this without subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. I mean, you don't pick it up and say, you know, 
the grocery bills, the doctor bills. <laughs> <laughs> Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, Allah. And the more we do it and the more it becomes ingrained into our hearts, the less, the less there is a need for it because it, it might start with our fingers, but it ends in our hearts. And when our hearts are constantly, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, Allah, that's an aspect of sainthood because the saint, that's the saint's heart. It's always in the midst of confusion, in the midst mm -hmm. of terrifying events, in the midst of whatever the world brings. It's yep. subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha la Allahu akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. So. Well, the heart is the whole thing. Yes. Being present there. You know, I mean, this question about is this sanctification relative today? Well, it's the only thing we have to do. We have to be who we are. We have to be in our hearts, present in our hearts, because in that place we are actually present, you know, instead of thinking of the past or future, lost in some yeah. other forgetful dimension. And Islam is, is, again, we sometimes don't think about these things, but Islam is a religion of the heart. The, the revelation starts in the heart of the Prophet, وسلم, and he shares it and passes it on to the hearts of the companions. So they're not called student, they're not talaba, tulab, tarisin, mutallimin, they're sahaba. And being in his presence, he was able to convey what his heart contained to their hearts. And they were able to touch hearts. And all, everyone, down right down to us, we are who we are as endeavoring and striving to be dutiful servants of God because our hearts were touched by a heart that was touched by a heart that was touched by a heart that was touched by the heart of Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah upon him. And what we try to, and so hence, al-ilmu fi-sudur wa laysa fi-sutur. Knowledge, true knowledge, is in the hearts. It's not in the lines of books. And so if we can move beyond the book, and if the book reminds us and alerts us to some aspect of reality that can put us into greater contact with, contact with our hearts, more power to the book. But if it doesn't, what good is the book? I think as you were saying earlier, reading, 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 close the book, you're still the same heart. You know, that's it. The heart is the place where eternity and the temporal world where it intersects. You know, this is the manifestation, as you said, of the Quran. You know, but you know, it's interesting with the, the Ghazali uses the motif of polishing the heart. And so I'm finding with little children who are four, five, and six years old, they can hang on to that. You know, that they know that the heart gets dust on it if they don't share, if they don't come when mommy calls, you know, if they brag, if they backbite. So they're quite aware of this heart that gets tarnished. And little children can go with that image. You can always bring it, oh, I see. You're getting some dust on your heart. Oh, no. You know. So the heart is a wonderful um, image or metaphor that Ghazali is using You know, for the shining heart is the saintly heart. Right. It's when it's completely, completely pure. And so the polishing of the heart is... And I think, what we're trying to do. And I think that's yeah. where the Quran and knowledge intersects with life. Mm. Because we, we have a verse in the Quran, Bilran ala kulubhim, mekanu yaksibun. Their hearts have been crusted over both based on what they've earned. And so a child can understand that before they see it in the Quran, as you say, that the heart gets dusty and we have to polish it and we have to clean it, cleanse it, and restore it, and then when they're old enough to realize the meaning of that Quranic verse, then, oh, I've been doing this all my life. And there's a power in that, that now the Quran's alive, and it's not just a book, it is the book. And it's the book because it reflects reality because ultimately it is reality. It's the eternal speech of God, the message that is conveying to us. And that, when, when that realization happens, that's the power of religion. And that's the power 
that has brought all of us together. You see so many people from so many different places mm -hmm. who've been united. So I think, and that, that's a very good point on egalitarian, that we have an well, idea. In, in essence, yes. We have a concept yeah. that is a lot different from that one where we can see that mm -hmm. uh, unity in Tohi. You know, we, we're all united under one God and, and we're all inspired by one message. And we see that we, as a human family, we share one destiny. And so that being the case, how can I encourage my brothers and sisters to look away from these divergent paths mm -hmm. that only divert our energy and our resources and come together to help us collectively mm -hmm. stay on this wide path that we're all traveling as human beings? <clears throat> and I think the saint is, is the guide. The saint is the guide who lets us know that all of this stuff happening out here, all of these divergent paths, don't be deceived by them. Don't be misled by them. Don't be misdirected by them. Follow me. And as, as you said, when you see and meet people with that beauty, whether they're simple villagers in the North African desert or they're the, the great sheikh, they have that quality. And you know that's a person worthy of being followed. You don't need to be encouraged by someone or, or demagogic appeal. You know, that person should be followed. And ultimately, I think that's, that's, we all should be people worthy of being followed by our children, by our coworkers, by whoever. And we should see in each other that same uh, attractiveness that I want to follow her. I want to be like her. And I might myself be someone that people say, I want to follow him. But when I see someone else, that's, that light is shining through them and that elevation has been achieved in them, then I can see an aspect of what I might lack in terms of the fullness of my human development. This is the Zaytuna College Catholic Muslim Forum this week, right? Integral human development. And I can see, you know, this aspect, I can lead, need a little, I need a little boost. And what, where that boost, I found it in this person. Him or her, he or she, mm -hmm. you know, that, and so now I can be fuller as a human being. And that fullness comes through, through humility, through a lot of what we've well, been we talking about. we have to be that for each other. I, in 87, I was sick with Guillaume-Barre and paralyzed. And okay. I could move my eyes, but I What's couldn't What's Guillaume-Barre, if he it's, would be um, so kind? It, like, shuts down your um, muscle and nervous system. Yeah. So I could, like, yeah, move my eyes, but I couldn't chew. I could suck. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I would move again. It was, I was misdiagnosed with Lou Gehrig's. And... I thought, what will I do for the rem do for the remainder of? I didn't know whether I was going to live very long, and I was lying in bed thinking about someone who did more for me than anyone, named Dr. Zahir Abdeen. She was an Egyptian doctor who was tireless, and she never stopped from midnight the whole day and night serving and opening mm -hmm. hospitals, never speaking ill of anyone. She was luminous. And I didn't care what she did. I didn't care if she was a doctor or she did all this or she went mm -hmm. out. It was the way she was. It was her state of being. And I thought, so I won't be able to do anything anymore, but I could be the luminous presence that I am in essence. And in that, I would be doing more for any, than anything. So in a certain sense, that's just what you were talking about. You were drawn to the people who came that particular luminosity in someone. Right. So we owe it to each other to be that luminous, shining heart that is what the other person is really seeing. There you go again it. with your Sufi stuff, <laughs> the luminosity. But well, I, 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 an hour. <laughs> I, I, exactly. No, there, there's a hadith is in Bukhari, yeah. Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, it's in virtually every collection, oh Allah. Place light in my heart and light in my vision and light in my hearing and light in my skin and light in my muscles, light in my nerves, light to my, to my right, light to my left, light above me, light beneath me, light before me, light behind me. And so 
We ignore on ala nur. We should be illuminated people, literally. And that's that's hadith, probably one of the soundest hadith, and there's just different versions and different compilations that we're praying. That's a prayer our Prophet taught us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, to pray for light and to pray for to be enlightened human beings. And I think as as we see God being removed from these various equations that we started with, we can see the darkness descending upon our world. And if we can be a light that can help people negotiate their way through this darkness, alhamdulillah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And pass the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. So I think we've spent a lot of time uh, Time flies when you're having fun. Well, don't you notice we're the same person? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. There isn't any difference. But would you like to just share a few concluding mar- uh, remarks on the subject? Not to cut it short. We, I'm sure we could sit here all day. I feel like I've been here for five minutes, actually. Isn't that all it's been? Yeah. Well, we're in, the, in a timeless dimension. Yes, I, I think that... Um, we learn all of these things from the time we're little. We know the ideas, we've heard all the ways we're supposed to be, what we have to be. But life is a gradual demonstration that these truths we're told, oh, look at the rain, yeah. how beautiful. Yeah. That the, is a gradual A different demonst- form of light. Yeah, great. <laughs> life is really a gradual demonstration <clears throat> of that these truths really are true. You may know it with your mind, and you may observe it. You may, but one day, you know, slowly, the, it, people, it happens to people at different stages. We should never judge one another, because everyone is on their own time scale. When their problems come in, when their issues, when their trials, whatever it is that starts to bring them into focus to realize that there is no place to go but here, you know, that mm-hmm. that's all that there is. And it's, what can one say, you know? We just have to be who we truly are. Yeah. And, and I, I think I mm-hmm. would add in concluding yeah. that it's becoming so hard for people to go here, to look in. And because so much is directing us out, you know, we need to project our opinions on the Facebook, or we need to project our professional virtues on the LinkedIn, or we need to project our picture on the Instagram, or we need to project our latest opinion, no matter how insignificant, mundane, or petty on the Snapchat, or in outward, outward projecting, projection, I think it's really time for us to start to look in. Or otherwise, you know, who, who knows what we might become and how divorced we might become and distance from the saintly presence whose names we mention in this part of the world and whose names we mention in uh, the Muslim part of the world that those figures who they, they possessed a nearness to God that people recognized. And those lights, if they're extinguished, uh, it's going to get really dark. But alhamdulillah, those lights will always be there. But you know what you're talking about, these diversions, you know, that people, the entertainment, always the outward. This is the, the problem. The nearer you are to God, the more spiritual you are. The more you head out, the greater the distance. And really, right. in that sense, evil yeah. in one sense is distance from God or separation. Mm-hmm. That's right. So of course, the further out you get from the spiritual dimension inside, the more material. It's almost like a snowball, and it goes faster and faster, and soon you're lost in your emails or whatever it is. But that's all a form of, of the egoic nature is very separative mm-hmm. by buying into your whole personal world and believing in it. And it's, it's, it's being lost 
from who you really are. And I think people are suffering greatly, and they keep thinking they're going to find it in all these different ways. And it's really in, and the, the, in the heart. And exactly, and, and to the degree that you strengthen and fortify your heart, and the degree that you fill your heart with light and love of the divine, then you get a true projection outward. But you're projecting your love, and you're projecting your mercy, and you're project, projecting your willingness to be a, a helpful and, a, and, and, and beneficial servant to those you might come into contact with. Mm -hmm. And so a person who's developed very little in a true human sense projects very little in reality, no matter how many likes or followers they have on all of these things out there that encourage us to garner likes and followers. And the prophets, they project it to the universe because that light was so strong, it, it expanded their hearts to the point where their hearts could encompass the entire universe. And the saints had a projection, not that far, but it was out there. And within that realm of light and love and mercy, there's a room for a whole lot of folks. And I think over the centuries, people have found a lot of refuge in those hearts because of their ability to extend outward. Allah al Mustan, may Allah help us. The one Allah wants good for, he gives him or her a sound understanding of the religion. So brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, beloved, we've had a, a, a very special time with a very special guest, uh, Aisha Gray Henry. May Allah preserve her, may Allah give her success in all of the great, great works uh, that she's undertaking and presently and have has undertaken in the past. And may Allah Ta'ala bless us to really understand the value of the saint and the need for the saint. And may Allah Ta'ala bless all of us to do those things that might open us up to being brought into that circle of the elect. Walhamdulillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah. وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة عيوننا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. This is Imam Zayd Shakir here at Zaytuna College with Aisha Gray Henry bidding you all a, a very blessed day, evening or night, whatever the case may be. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.